Okay. All right, so I'm very disorganized today with lots of good excuses. One one is that I've uh, uh, just technical problems with my drawing tablet, but hopefully that's going to be okay. Um, but that has really distracted me from the thread of what I had been talking about in the past week. So I was really, you know, telling you about this Grotendieck Teichmuller um, theory and uh, this baby special case of it that I call the Gaussian designs based on the Gaussian integers. And, uh, you know, I, I even produced computer pictures of that, um, of those designs. And, um, and, and, and at first I didn't really know what I was doing. So I was, you know, just kind of faking it. I, and, and, and I'm, I'm a little bit better than that now. I, I, you know, I know that some of this is actually working. I understand some of what's going on. Um, but, uh, the fact that I got some part of it, so, uh, right, what did I get to work? So, so I, ha I still have this idea that Kronecker's Jugendtraum is sort of like a baby, can be seen as a baby special case of grotendieck teichmuller theory. Um, it's, it's, or it's just, maybe, maybe that's the wrong way to describe it, but it's just, it's a good example or, or family of examples that you can use in trying to understand what uh, grotendieck teichmuller theory is about, uh, the, th the theory of, starting with Grotendieck's theory of designs or des design down font, design down font, whatever they're called. Um, and um, so, so, you know, when, when, when I, when, after I got to, to the point where, uh, where I was at, at least satisfied that something was working right, that it really is true that you can view the Jugendtraum as fitting into grotendieck teichmuller theory in this way. Um, that sort of encouraged me to sort of, I, I, I'm taking a more expansive look now at, at some of the things that are going on here. I mean, it, it's a more expansive look, so I should have, uh, I could have some name for whatever it is that I'm trying to talk about now, maybe Galois theory or something like that. Um, so one of the things I've, one of the things I've been threatening to do at various points is to try to explain to you what the Jugendtraum is. And I've tried that in various ways, wasn't really satisfied with any of the results yet. But, um, so what should I try right now? I think I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into the middle of something here. And you'll have to sort of try to swim with it as usual. And um, it's what I'm going to describe is a false conjecture that I conjectured some years ago. And it's it's really, really false, but I still have the feeling that there's some germ of something, some truth or something of value to be learned from this um, or mm -hmm. so so I, 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 I'm going to describe the conjecture and it's going to be completely false, but hmm. we're going to think about it anyway and see if there's some sort of way to fix it. So, so the conjecture has to do with ideal class groups of number fields. So number fields, number rings, depending on how you think of it. Um, uh, so you're not sharing your tablet screen okay that's 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 a good reminder okay, so uh, this is a good time i should turn it on right now so we're why we're okay trying to share, share screen here okay right now, right now now we test whether it really works or whether everything's still screwed up <laughs> right this is the yes okay you can see stuff well but can i also write yes okay <laughs> so um
Well, so let, so let, 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 mm. <laughs> let me let me try to review an example that I that I often talk about. Um, you know, an example that I often use to orient myself to some of the things that are going on here. Um, so I'm going to draw a little picture of a Galois correspondence here. And in this picture of the Galois correspondence, we're going to see a little bit of um, some ideal class groups showing up. So okay. let me try to draw this. So um, I guess what we're going to be looking at here is the Galois correspondence for the subfields of the 20th cyclotomic field. So yeah, I've talked about this before. I think you'll... Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You might be bored with this already, but uh, so... No. So, so what's going on here? So we can write this as as a field. We can write it as the rational numbers adjoin a quantity, which I guess I'll call x for the moment. And modulo the relations that say that x is a primitive 20th root of unity. In other words, we want to mod out by the 20th cyclotomic polynomial. And yep. So we think explicitly about what that is like for a moment. It's something like, uh, um, well, if we if we just say that it's a non-primitive twentieth root of unity, we're just saying x to the twentieth is equal to unity. Um, but when we want to say it's primitive, we want to, you know, say that it's not a fourth root of unity and it's not a fifth root of unity. Maybe that's enough. So you would, you know, we'd say something like x to the 20th minus 1 and then over x to the 5th minus 1 uh -huh. and over x to the 4th minus 1. But then there's kind of an inclusion exclusion thing going on here. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, maybe we just have to, right? I mean, oh. that, Oh, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> they both have a factor of x minus one in common, at least. So maybe I sh should stick that up here. Maybe that's it. I mean, that sounds like all there. So what degree would this work out to be? That's good because it looks like 19, which is what for some reason I thought it should be. Why did I say 19? No. <laughs> 19? Let's see. Sorry. No, what am I doing? This isn't right. Let's see. Ah, it's, X, it's 21 on top and it's 20 on the bottom? No, uh, 9 on the bottom. Oh, God, I can't multiply. I can't add. Yeah. Am I doing this right? Let's see, what am I trying to say? X to the fifth minus 1 is, let's see. <laughs> yeah, well, I really, sorry, I was doing really bad arithmetic errors there. Yeah. So it's 21 minus 9. Well, that's not working out right. I, I, I've, I've obviously forgotten something here. Well, what's, um, it supposed, what's it supposed to be? Uh, it's supposed to be eighth degree. Uh huh. And you just know that because you did it once or something. No, I did it a million times. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, and, and that also means that the Galois group, uh, this you know, this is an abelian Galois group, and it's an eight element. Uh, Galois group, and it's it's in fact it's the GL one of um of of Z mod twenty. Say yes. that again. The Galois group of this. The Galois field. group of this field the, is or, what? Yeah, the the automorphism group of this field over the rationals which is over everything, um, is 
uh, GL1, comma, Z mod 20. And that's an eight element to be a group because, you know, um, the Euler totient function of 20 is eight or something like that. The eight, there are the eight things relatively prime. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh. yeah. <laughs> so, so this thing over here, this, this is not correct yet. Uh, I've, obviously, I didn't do the inclusion ex exclusion right yet here. But so let's just put a like question mark there to say that that's not quite right yet, but it's probably on the right track. Um, and it also doesn't matter too much. Um, so let's see. So this is very sloppily drawn. Um, there's the prime two is involved here and the prime five is involved here. I guess there's some Chinese remainder theorem stuff going on here where the prime, you know, two and the prime five in some ways act very independently of each other. So we have, um, well, but two goes into 20 twice. So we're actually dealing with DL1 uh, comma Z mod four there, which has the uh, elements one and three. And uh, GL1 Z mod five is cyclic uh, like this. That's the powers of two mod five. And um, mm -hmm. so what does the Chinese remainder theorem say? It's something like, uh, this must be one, let's see. This is maybe three and 11, maybe this is 11, maybe? Is that right? And maybe this is seven? Maybe this is nine, or maybe this is three. So mod on the two edge, they gotta be right mod four. Is that the idea? Yes. Uh huh. That's right. Because four is the highest power of two that goes into five. Yeah. And so I think it's about like that. And and so the point is that what that you know you you have. X, you get these automorphisms, X goes to X to the power of any one of these things. You saying that right? Like, let me, let me give an example of what we could have X goes to X to the power of 19. And that's a kind of fun example if I did it correctly, because that one actually, that's the one that, you know, it's kind of like a complex, Conjugation restricted to this twentieth uh -huh. cyclotomic field. Yeah, um, but the others work as well, and those are all the automorphisms of this field. And um, so, so that means there's like a Galois correspondence where we have the small, you know, Galois correspondence is always upside down. The small subfields correspond to the big subgroups. It's fitting in here. So we have the big subgroup at the bottom. Let's see. It's gonna it's gonna work out like uh, I think like this, 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 this. Very sloppily drawn. So how does this work? At the at the smallest one is at the top. Then there are these ones. And mm, I guess it's that. And there's this one. There's this one. And there's this one. And there's this one. 
So these are the subfields of the 20th cyclotomic field. And they're arranged in a way, I hope you can sort of see. So these ones in the central column are sort of much busier than the others. Like this, this, this quadratic extension in the central column fits into all of these quartic extensions. And this quartic extension in the central column uh, just so happens that it contains all these quadratic extensions. So I think that's sort of the, the lattice structure or the poset structure, containment structure. Um, and yeah, so, so and, and, and what are these? So this, like, this is the rationals down at the, down at the bottom. At the top, we have the rationals adjoin The primitive twentieth roots of unity. Am I saying this right? That you just have to you, right. You just have to join one of them, and you get all of them. Right. Mm -hmm. Hope I'm saying that right. And um, this one over here, if 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 you know, if you think about all these, it works out that. This one is rationals adjoin primitive fourth root of unity, which is basically I, the, the imaginary unit I. Um, this one is um, the rationals adjoin a primitive fifth root of unity. Saying that right? I guess that's right. Right. So, so at the bottom, there's a you know, there's the the base field, the rational numbers. Then the next row up is these quadratic extensions. The next row up is those quartic extensions, and the single thing at the top that's the octic extension, which is the twentieth cyclotomic field itself. Now, so. You know, there are all sorts of things that, you, that are somehow you're somehow supposed to understand in a very concrete, pictorial way. Like the ones that I've named so far are the ones that like are just a single row or a single column. Well, am I saying that? What do I mean? The two you named, yeah, the the two exciting ones, yeah. Or a well, in some ways, right, you could say these are the exciting ones, or you could say these are the boring ones. Um, well, I didn't say they're, yeah, anyway, they're fundamental, yeah. Yeah, so uh, they're very fundamental. The one um, in the middle, right below the top one, is a sub-single column guy. Say it again, the one where? In the, that. Yeah. Which one is that? So that's sort of interesting, because it's just in a single row. But it's not the whole single row. Oh, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I would think that it had only to do. Yeah. So it has something only to do with GL1 Z mod 5, but. Because the column is about the column is labeled five, but 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 the fact that the column is labeled five is what's making the the extension with all the dots in that column be Q with a fourth root of unity adjoined. So there's this kind of yeah duality. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's the usual kind of. Thing where the x axis is where y is constant or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So uh, I was sort of. What? So I'm just sort of confused about that <clears throat> one that I got you to point to because. Because. <clears throat> right, well, <laughs> it seems like it should only have to do with a fourth root of unity somehow. But that can't be right, because. Oh, well, I, th I think, aren't you just kind of like upside down again? Remember, the Galois correspondence is upside down. So this is. 
you know, a bigger oh. field. Oh, okay. North reach of Munich. Okay. So it is actually fun to work all of this out from first principles, but we're going to do yeah. it much. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have some old notebook where we, I think we, right. we, you ran us through this whole chart. Yeah. Right, so, right, right. Okay. I'll just resist. Uh, okay, sorry. So when you. You, you can bring oh, up all yeah. sorts of things. Well, I, I might not have very good answers for some of them, but we'll, well, we'll, I was just hoping you'd tell me which one that is that you're well, you, that you were pointing out until I started. Yes, I, I, I am going to tell you, but in a in a, in a funny, I'm going to tell you what these quadratic ones are first. Okay, sure, so sure. I think this one is because that will you know the this quadratic one will just be the compositum or whatever they call it of all of those. Yep. Uh, I think that might actually be a word some people use for compositum. Okay. Sounds like um, you didn't just make it up. I don't think so. So this one is no. where you have the square root of negative five. This one in, in the middle on the bottom is the rationals adjoin the square root of why why did I okay <laughs> let's see why didn't you write a two there no. yeah 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 that's yeah, you don't need to write a two there. so let, let me write it this way I'll assume, <laughs> I'll assume that all roots are square <laughs> right I guess I'll write negative five oh, one okay. half okay I don't like this afraid. one what I was afraid you were going to be your usual hyper systematic self okay fine uh, right yep that's what i was hoping anyway so the one that you're asking about is just you know kind of all of these but you only need to name two of them because once you have two of them it's going to give the third one so okay let's say uh square root of plus or minus five <laughs> yeah how should, how should i say this I, I i don't okay i won't i won't okay I'll, I'll just say square root of negative one and square root of five. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that, that may, it just gets me so, back into the groove here of how this stuff works, yeah. Right, so, um, so without, you know, with so this so, so far is with being very, um, Not, not but, but, you know, not putting not not putting in a lot of effort into any of this yet. This is uh, already showing us uh, very concretely what these are, except for this one over here on the upper <laughs> left. Yeah. And I'm not sure that one has any snappy name like the others. Um, it well, you could well you could say you could just say it's the real part of the twentieth cyclotomic field so i'll say that okay That's... but you know if you want to give explicit quantities that generate it there are that you know they're less famous uh -huh. but i think ramanujan Ram, ramanujan I, I, I can't remember how you should pronounce that um talked about this field in his original letter oh. to Hardy, I think. Um, don't trust me on that, though. We should maybe investigate that somehow. So, um, so there's a thing that you can there's a thing that you can see here. Like I said, I I, I made the claim that you can see, and I hope I'm you know. As always, I'm hoping that I'm more or less correct about most things I'm saying, but today I'm a little treading on thin ice because um because I know that there's a some false stuff involved here. Um but uh let's see. Sorry, I'm just having trouble finding my my cursor here. Okay, that shows it a little bit better. Um so
Let me tell you where there are some ideal classes. There are some non-trivial ideal classes that are visible in here. It's basically, um, what am I trying to say? Maybe it's basically with this extension right here. There might be another one somewhere. Yeah, I'm wondering about this one. But what's going on with this with this one here that I've just filled in in red is the what am I trying to say? The the simple-minded lowbrow thing about this extension is that. Right, it's like, this is like unramified at two and it's unramified at five. And I think it's also unramified at, you know, the Conway's prime negative one, but that's probably less visible in this picture because we didn't have an explicit axis for negative one in this picture. So I think this one up here is also unramified at two and unramified at five, but I think it is ramified at negative one. Um, I'm a little bit confused about that, but I think that, you know, because it's going from the real part of the field to the, to the whole mm -hmm. thing. And I think that, you know, that step where you go from the real part to the complex thing, that's ramification at the. What is ramification at negative one? Is there like some normal name for that? That's not the thing people usually quite say, right? Well, they may say, Archimedean ramification or ram, you know, right. The, the negative one is Conway's name for the Archimedean prime here. But other people, what do other people call it? Maybe they call it infinity or the infinite prime or the Archimedean prime. I'm not really sure. I can't remember what they call it. Do you know what they call it? No, um, I'm confused. I don't know if I know what it is, more importantly. Can you say what it is? is <laughs> it's 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 weird compared to the others um yeah. I, I i mean what, what am i trying to say it it, it you know it, it's 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 the one for which you need valuations instead of ideals um you know so there are these p-adic valuations on the rational field and then you complete with respect to those p-adic valuations and you get like the p-adic fields or something like that. Yep. Yeah. But there's also these, these Archimedean valuations. I'm not, again, I'm not sure I'm using the right word valuation here or something like that, but it's something right. like that. Yeah. And so. Yeah, okay. You, 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 associate to, you associate to each of these generalized primes, some sort of completion with respect to evaluation of the um, of the field that you're starting out with, the number field that you're starting out with, and um, you, you know the, the the point is that there are Archimedean valuations and there are non-Archimedean valuations, and depending on your mood, one or the other of those seems very standard and vanilla, and the other one seems very bizarre. But, you know, you tend to change your mind about which one is the bizarre one um, and which one is the vanilla one, the, the more you learn. Except you might keep on changing your mind, right? I mean, so, yeah. so <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was about, to, you'll probably disagree with me, but I was about to yeah. say that like, if you're feeling like you're doing analysis, then the non-Archimedean ones seem weird. And if you feel like you're doing algebra, then the Archimedean ones. Seems uh, it seems that seems that seems like an interesting proposal. That maybe that's a good way to think about it. I'll have to think about that. Um, so I'm also not sure I've thought about it that way, but go ahead. Yeah. So, could you sketch? Tell me what ramification at the at the at the Archim at this Archimedean valuation is. I guess I vaguely know what ramification at a prime is. But I don't know if I know it all, but how the 
how how it works for the for the other for the Archimedean valuations. <clears throat> well, I, I, I just like tell me how you see it. Right? You don't need to give me the whole theory of it if you don't know it. But like, I'm just imagining it has something to do with the fact that like we're. I really don't know, actually. Actually, I really don't know. It has something to do with the, like the real, purely real fields versus the ones that aren't purely real. Is yeah, right? yeah, it, 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 it yeah. I, I, like I was trying to say, this one is the. Let's all right. Let's see the ones where it goes from a real flavor field to a complex flavor field. So, like, um, you know, that's. Let's see. I I, I, should, I should put these in a different color, right? I should try to put these in like. And so I read or something like that. No, no, that's 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 right. That's not right. So it's like. Mm -hmm. Those ones, but not until here does that one become complex. And I guess it also becomes complex over there. Is that right? And but but this one is still real over here, but the you know it's like. So is it true that every path from the bottom to the top? It had better it cross just yeah, like right. the Rubicon because, or something. Yeah, right. Because that because that's the all you know you can you can with 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 yes. with the Archimedean prime you can only ramify once. You never cross the same river twice. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Yeah. So is it true that that I account for every path here? If you go if you if you go this way, it looks like it in my unsystematic uh, yeah search. I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, and like I say, it's the time when you switch from real to complex. Yeah. Uh, but okay, okay. But all right. There are all sorts of sophisticated ways of thinking about this, but I, I'm still at this point talking about very unsophisticated ways of thinking about this. And so. So anyway, so that's Archimedes. You're getting yeah. ramification in this Archimedean sense when you. On those green edges, then that's the that's that's it, yes, that's the Archimedean ramification, ramification extensions. Uh -huh. That's right. right in this in this correspondence. I'll do it for now. Yeah, and um, mm -hmm. you know when you when you really start getting into what ramification is really about, then you you know you start making these very systematic analogies between arithmetic and geometry. You see arithmetic as a kind of geometry. I guess you tend to call it arithmetic geometry or something like that. But in this arithmetic geometry, there are things that are like covering spaces, but they can be like branched covering spaces. And that branching is the ramification. Um, so, you know, uh, Ramification of number fields is a kind of crypto geometric form of uh, of of the branched covers, and um, right. So what right what branched covers do is they sort of you know if you're working with like branched covers of Riemann surfaces or something like that, they kind of violently expand the fundamental group that you thought you were dealing with um right because by you know the branching sort of treats the the topology of the Riemann surface in a somewhat violent way and um you know you thought you had a particular fundamental group but these covers that are branched there it's like you know you have extra things that involve moving around a point loops around a point which you know you thought you couldn't go around a point you thought that was like a contractible loop but the branch covers right so again i'm <laughs> i'm not saying things that really make sense yet but i'm just trying to give hints about the intuition yeah. behind these things. are the ones sorry yeah. you can yeah. stop me if i'm digging yeah go ahead go ahead bar but can i like see can you like show me which all ones are ramified at two or at five. 
Yes. Uh, I, yeah, I think we can. <laughs> and again, there should be like a, you know, a sort of conservation law or, set, or something that says that it's independent of path, the amount of ramification. That uh -huh. you... Yeah, I was hoping, hoping so. So, oh yeah, in, in, right. And in fact, and, and right. And I was, I've been trying to say that there's a very low brow way of thinking about this. So you just look at, um, when you want, let, uh, am I saying this right? Again, I get mixed up whether the rows correspond to two and the columns correspond to five or vice versa. We'll have to figure it out. So let's look at where the left-hand column shrinks in some way. Okay. And that's probably going to be where there's ramification of five, I think, or something like that. Uh -huh. So, you know, we're going like... Right, there's a sort of a factor of two ramification um, with the left-hand column. Let's see, maybe, I, I'm going to try and draw it more clearly which arrow it's attached to. I'm sort of hard to see. It's supposed to be this one over here. Where's this other one here? Yeah, I'm not sure. Let's see. Um, and this one also has two. So yeah, I guess you multiply the numbers along the path and they should, the conservation laws that it should come out to be the same product. Um, so let's see, this is still just, you know, one. Uh, this one's two, let's see. This one, yeah, what is this one? This one also looks like a factor. Both of these are factors of two, is that right? Yeah. And, and this is factor of two? And the, and the upper right green is also no that's a factor of, that's just one. Oh, upper right you said yeah well yeah <laughs> upper right green the most upper right of the green edges is also a yes that's a two mm -hmm. okay okay and up in there you think that's, you think every path now has a four? That's, I don't think it should, it sounds like it does. I think that might be right. And um, so what's that, I need another color here. I have blue, red, and green, I don't know, purple or something like that. So this is gonna be for the, well, first of all, we did, did we decide what the blue ramification was? Did we decide what it was five or something like that? I think uh, it's going to be two because two. No. Uh, yeah, I think it's five. Well, that's my guess. But what were you saying? Okay. You know, because it, adds, it adds up to a total or multiplies out to a total of four. And that's the size of the multiplicative group of Z mod oh. five. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. And yeah, okay. Yeah. So the, the other one, I think, is where the yeah, top okay. row shrinks. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes and sense. And that would just be. Uh, I ran out of colors here. <laughs> I can't draw this one. Huh? Let's see. Uh, it looks like there's a two right there. Oh, and there's also a two right there. And um, mm -hmm. yeah. What about going from, oh, and there's a two. Yeah, right there. some, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. okay. And again, those those green edges, I didn't put a number on them because that's Archimedean. It's weird. I don't really even know what numbers I should put. It probably is a two or something like that. But, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not you can just do it once or in this case for some weird reason. There's you can't yeah, and, and and there is like right, there is some sort of lowbrow way to think of that. There's like a third dimension, you know. This looks like this, it looks like we just have two and five but we should have like negative one as well. So, <laughs> but it, it operates very differently from the other prime. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I have anything until, yeah, some other day I should remind us of how the, uh, yeah, how, how the negative one fits in here. But I, I, so the only, so there's only one edge in this thing that has no ramification at all. Okay, cool. Do you see which one it is? Well, you showed me a long time ago before I started pestering you to tell me the whole. Right, that's right. But it, but it, but it, but it does work out, right? I mean, this one up here is only ramified at infinity, but um, this one isn't even ramified at infinity. So yeah. So so what am I trying to say? That what am I trying to say? That it means it's not like you're saying that like. Each time you go up, you either get ramification or else something else has got to give. And one way to see that something else is going to give is that the something about the ideal class group. Yeah, I mean, it's something like. That makes some sense. See, I, I mean, it, 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 it's something like. Right, this is the very. <laughs> this is the very zigzag one. I mean, again, this one over here has, has a little bit of zig in it. But, you know, that's the Archimedean. Oh, well, let's see. Yeah, I'm not going to worry about this one because I don't understand the Archimedean stuff well enough at the moment. But but this one here is the only one. It, 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 the, the, right? It, uh, right? This is the one where neither the row nor the neither the first row nor the first column is shrinking yeah so it's all stuff elsewhere that's shrinking and, and that sort of means it has to be sort of zigzaggy or it has to be correlated it has to be right which right the 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 coloring pattern has to be a correlation between row and column rather than just being purely a row thing or a column thing yeah um, and that means that there's a non-trivial -tri ideal class here. This this kind of very simple-minded thinking does not account for all of the ideal class group, because apparently ideal class groups are kind of uh, the impression I have is that they're somewhat subtle to understand. Whereas this is a very easy, simple-minded thing to understand. Like this is, I mean, there's something very abelian about this part of the. Idea class group. I mean, right? It's what am I trying to say? That it's an abelian extension all the way from it's an it's abelian extension is all the way from the bottom all the way to the top. So somehow, I mean, right? The the Hilbert class field is supposed to be like a maximal unramified extension or something like that. So so it's kind of making sense that. Maximal unramified abelian extension, or or just extension. yeah, okay. Ma maximal unramified abelian extension, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um. So okay, I, I guess what I'm trying to say, right? I'm doing, doing a bad job of this, but what I'm trying to say is that there's a very concrete example here that we can look at of a um of a non-trivial ideal class, and um. See, I thought I thought this was working so great, and now I can't see where the. I'm looking for the. Oh, maybe it's like this. Okay. Okay, there it is. Well, one so, thing. Right, that, what? One thing that I'll just read. Maybe you'll get around to this, but one thing I'll just register. Yeah. When you yeah. say ideal class group, I think of that as attached to a single number 
field or number ring, but you're talking about two here with that big fat red edge connecting them. And so I want to find out eventually how, when you say we see a non-trivial ideal class group, then like why it's why it's like well, tying together. Because those. remember that ideal class group is a little bit like a like a first homology group or a yeah. first cohomology group or something like that. I get mixed about which one you should th think about it as. And it's very important to get straight which one it's more like. Yeah, I will say cohomology because it's like line bundles. Ideals are sort of like projective modules which are like bundles. So anyway. It's really important to get this straight. Uh, but what am I trying to say that um, the all right so what was the question <laughs> the question was what um the ideal class group is something oh, right why am i talking about two so right yeah. so we're talking about but 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 it, it but it's the same it's the same thing that it's the, it's you know it's it, the answer to your question is just think about the homotopy theory and, and uh, analogies, and it makes sense because when you have a non-trivial fundamental group, it means you have some covering space, and you know so that's what's going on here that you know this this extension, this is this is the thing that that you know this this is the thing whose spectrum is is morally not simply connected mm -hmm. and this extension is this you know the spectrum of that extension is the thing that is like a a, a cover and in fact like an unbranched cover so a, you know a, a true topological cover of um of, of this of the spectrum of this so that's a that's a, a, a simple-minded answer, relatively simple-minded answer to your question. Not a complete answer, but hopefully that's good enough for now, right? Yep. Now, so now, yeah, now you're getting me. Yeah, you're getting me more. That's good, but in another way, it's getting me more confused because now it's making me think. To want to take back my answer and think, say that like now I'm wanting to think of the ideal class group as like a first homology group, as like an abelianized fundamental group yeah i mean I, it, it's it's so important it's so important to get straight whether it's when or whether it's more like homology or more like cohomology and i'm so just you're, so you're I'm getting just, an unbranched abelian cover here i guess yes yes mm -hmm. yes perhaps literally perhaps morally yes right. but something like that so and and, and again right the um you know, I'm, 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 I'm admitting that at this point I'm still being just terribly sloppy about this duality between homology and cohomology, and um, you know that's a, re a really bad thing to do. But sometimes you can sort of pretend to get away with it, um, right? That's kind of thing physicists often do all the time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they blur the conflate the thing and it's dual sometimes because they imagine that they have some God-given structure and they're usually wrong. But um, but I'm I'm kind of doing something. I'm just being very, very sloppy about this. And it's really important to eventually be not sloppy about this, but we'll see how it goes. Um I guess I was just gonna comment that you may want to think about this duality that we're talking about here. There may be different ways of thinking about it. In some way, it's kind of like a Fourier, a kind of Fourier duality, and that may be an important theme. I mean, perhaps all dualities are some kind of Fourier duality, but it, it may be an important theme in, in understanding in what sense this is a kind of Fourier duality. So, um, so let's 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 now start drawing some actual pictures of the of some of the number fields here. So that's going to be like zero. Let's say um, let's say that's one. So oh yeah, I'll circle the origin there. That's zero, one, two, 
negative one is like over there, I guess. So, the, right, this is the one where we have the square root of negative five. So the square root, no, yeah, square root of negative five is about 2.2, .2, roughly speaking. Uh, and then it's square root of negative five, so it's in the imaginary direction. So, so, um, yeah, that's right. I'm still having trouble. <laughs> I do not. I screwed up here. So it's like up there approximately. This is very rough, approximate picture of where these things are. Uh huh. So this is like one, and this is like square root of negative five. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of drawing the lattice of algebraic integers inside this number. And I hope I'm getting it right, because sometimes the lattice of algebraic integers isn't quite what I might guess at first. But in this case, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it really is just this thing here. So I, I'm saying that, you know, like, yeah, this know, kind, of like a, kind of like I a fundamental. Right. I think this is sort of, well, this is like, known to me and famous just because it's like the first case of a non-trivial ideal class group and you can like use Minkowski's geometry of numbers stuff to really this example is they, you can see why they like the Euclidean algorithm for unique prime factorization fails because these rectangles are too tall yeah that's interesting that's interesting um so anyway, I just happened to have thought about it, so I know it's right. <laughs> yeah, and and that's sort of that, right. That, that's so so I may be belaboring this more than I really should because you already have some of this um, knowledge. That's fine. So so, um, so right. So one of the things you're hinting at here, or maybe almost saying, is that we've got a. Um, a non-trivial ideal class. Again, I'm having trouble fitting this all in the picture here. And, and I'm having trouble. It was working a moment ago. What's going on here? I see that thing. Okay, that goes there. Where's this thing over here? Okay, there, I don't know. I don't know what, how it's working, but. <laughs> all right, all right. So let's see. So I hope I'm doing that right. One call it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, I think it's there. And there. And there. This is all very approximate. These are irrational numbers, but I'm sort of drawing them as they might actually be rational. Okay. So, yeah. So, where is this non trivial idea that we're hinting at? So, we could take as generators of this non-trivial idea. We could take, I think, we could take. Um, don't tell me. Uh, I was thinking of taking as generators this element over here, and maybe this element over here. So we would get, you know, this whole, right. 
maybe I'll sort of try to circle the generators there. But we get this whole Turn this right. Can you get a sense of what it looks like? So where is it? It's like there. It, it's it's yeah, it's kind of there's something vaguely checkerboardish about it, but in this, you know, see, so I guess this one is down here. So does this seem right that this really is an ideal? It, 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 this lattice is closed under multiplication by. I, it feels I'm confused. I may be making some mistake. I thought that this. Yeah. With this lattice, this new lattice, yeah, had to be similar to the original lattice. Similarity to the original lattice mean that means principleness, right? Because the oh, that's that oh, 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 yeah. the, yeah, okay. the similarity. Yeah, that's the principle yeah. idea. Okay, good. Sorry. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So that's the whole point that this, it, it if not. it is an ideal, I'm hope I hope if we can somehow convince ourselves that's an ideal, but the fact that it's Okay, I got it exactly backwards. Yeah. Okay, I see. If it were similar, right, right, it would just be multiples of the original uh, ideal, the original of integers. Yeah. Right. So we get another chance to apply our general principle about acute triangles. That you know, the the um, the whole ring of algebraic integers as an ideal in itself. Or as a fractional ideal in the field, um, has you know this acute triangle that's like a right triangle that's like a fundamental acute triangle, whereas this other one has a an isosceles thing. So yeah, so the, right, the, the fact that their fundamental acute triangles are just visibly different from each other means that these are not similar lattices, and and mm -hmm. you know so that so that this 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 one in blue and gold or whatever is a non-principal idea. Um, and so it, yeah, so 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 this is uh, generated by what? It's generated by two and one plus the square root of negative five. And um, right, but now what is its, uh, what is the square of this idea? So let's see, is, I, I, does it seem right that the, right? You can think of ideals in these, because number rings are Dedekind rings, whatever that means. Um, that means almost all the ideals, any non-trivial ideal in some sense of non-trivial is an invertible module. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's an invertibility under, you know, functorial tensor product. Um, that's when I said line objects. Module, when I said projective module a while back, I meant I should have said invertible module. I was, I was saying I, the ideals are body ball modules and they're yeah, invertible module. Uh huh. These in right, case. but in particular, you know, in, invertible is the one dimensional special case of being a projective module. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, and um, so we've got uh, so we've got yeah. So I I think that does does this seem right that uh, 
when you think of these invertible ideals as invertible modules, that the you can think of the product as kind of the, the tensor product. Uh huh. I think you're right. Yep. So if you know if so so for example if if we if we take if we take this ideal over here and if we square that ideal and if we get um, a principal ideal then that means that this non-principal ideal is order two in the ideal class group and i think that's what's going to happen so what, yeah how does that happen so what, what is the square of the ideal it's going to be kind of like uh it's going to have four in it and it's going to have are we doing this right it's going to have like uh two plus two times the square root of negative five and it's going to have Negative five in it? No, it's going to have, yeah, I get, no, what am I trying to say? No, the, whatever the square is of one plus the square root of negative five. Um, can you figure that out? <laughs> yeah, it's negative four plus two. That sounds right. The square root of negative five. Right. When I do that calculation, I actually usually do it in a sort of, graphical geometric way where but but i but i guess i guess this i guess that pencil and paper calculation is pretty good at doing this sort of thing so um so that doesn't look terribly manifestly principal but maybe maybe if we just kind of maybe we could just see how it really is principal so like what's going on here well you you can add the first and the last of those generators and you get and you see did you get two times the square root of negative five hmm. yes why don't i why am i not succeeding in just getting square root of negative five out of that stuff oh well because the generator is going to be two i think i think i think this is gonna i'm um, you know if if, if i oh, oh, correctly oh. This is going to be. Oh, oh okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. This is actually equal to two. So, but, yeah. but I think you were on the right track. So, what am I trying to say? That take mm -hmm. the middle one. Yeah. And subtract the other, subtract the ends from the middle. Right. Or in other words, take take the sum of the ends and subtract that from the middle. So the sum of the ends is just two times radical negative five. Uh huh. And subtract that from the middle, and you just get two. Yeah. And right. So I'm claiming that you can see that you know there's a, the containment goes both ways. That two you know two is contained in the thing that's generated by the three elements, but the three elements are also are all contained in the thing that's generated just by two. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so let me try to tell you what the stupid false conjecture was. <laughs> right, maybe I'm going so slow because uh, I'm not enthusiastic about admitting to this really stupid false. No, no, no. Anyway, it's been good to review this stuff. I like this. Sure. I haven't thought about this kind of number theory for a long time. So, uh -huh. but anyway, don't. Anyway, it's fine to <laughs> say the conjecture is false. It's not embarrassing. You're only embarrassing if you act embarrassed because that's like, then you like sort of admitting that you thought it was, you ever thought it was. <laughs> All right, something like that. Um, right, I still think there's something to be learned from going through thinking about this false mm -hmm. conjecture. For me, there's something to be learned at the very least. So, um, right. So, right. Somehow the somehow the idea is that you're supposed to use the ideal class group 
to get a hold of all the unramified ex uh, uh, all the unramified abelian extensions of um, the, the number field that you're dealing with. And so in particular, right? I mean, so like the, the, the so-called Hilbert class field, that's supposed to be the unwrapping that, boy, there's, right, some of these analogies I don't completely understand, but um, it, 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 it's, it's, I want to say it's supposed to be like some version of a universal cover, maybe a universal, universal, universal unramified abelian cover or something like that. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think that's what it, that's, that's the thing. I hope it's something like that, but sometimes I get confused about that, but it's, it's certainly something like that. And, and, but then that field, that Hilbert class field is going to have all of its subfields, the Galois correspondence for all of its subfields. And so here's, here's my stupid idea. My stupid idea is My stupid idea is maybe we could get all of the fields that maybe we could get all the subfields of the Hilbert class field, including the Hilbert class field itself, just by sort of building them out of these ideas. Out of out of things in the ideal class group. Out of representatives of the idea. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, right. So, is this I, the I, false I, conjecture, by the way, or you sound like you're starting to believe it? Whatever. No, no, no. It's false. But it's, okay, okay. But it's but it's a tempting false. Okay, yeah. So it seemed like such a good idea at the time. Um, but but you know, there's there's massive things wrong with it, but it's still it's an interesting thing to try. So, do you, do you see what I'm saying? I mean, I'm I'm saying that you could like. I mean, since it's false, we can be sloppy about this. It's, it's sort of like, I want to say, you know, you've got this ideal class group. Well, like just sort of like pick one representative of each ideal class. Uh -huh. And now take the direct sum of all those representatives. And my, and, and my idea was that that direct sum would sort of become the algebraic, the ring of algebraic integers in the Hilbert class field. Because it, right, it's the right size. That direct sum is, the, is sort of the right size, the right dimension. I'm, uh, I'm confused. You're taking a direct sum of? Of ideals. Ideals, and I'm going to make the. I, I'm, I'm claiming that there should be a. I'm claiming that there should be a sort of semi-obvious way to make that direct sum into a ring. Wow, I don't. So it's a module of your original ring of algebraic integers because it's a direct sum of modules. Yes, but then you're trying to give it a ring structure. Yes, and and you know if I was really trying to get this to work, I know it's not going to work. So the, the, again, the fact that it's not really going to work right sort of makes me feel like I have permission to be very sloppy about okay trying to pretend that it's going to work. Uh, but but um, right, I mean if, you know suppose you're in suppose you have an see what what I'm trying to say is that this is going to be like. See what we're doing is what we would be doing in this case is we'd be getting things that were this this ring that I'm if if this succeeded if this direct sum really did become a ring in the way I wanted it to be 
Mm -hmm. Then that would that ring would be sort of like graded by the ideal class group. And each grade would be one dimensional. Why is it one dimensional? Because each ideal class is, is an invertible module. Each ideal is, is each of these ideals is an invertible module. Okay, I see. I see. So you know, is it, let's see. Yeah, so let's yeah. see. Yeah. So I mean, it's supposed to be true that the Hilbert class field, as a field, it's a vector space over your original field, and your and it's dimension. Is this true that its dimension is the size of the ideal class group? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, if I'm not screwing so, up, yes. And so there I was talking about fields so that I could talk about dimension, but then you could also look at the algebraic integers of the Hilbert class field and you could, it is yeah. a module of the algebraic integers of the original field. Because it, and to, is it true that it's like a, it's like a sum of, is it like a, is it like a free, uh, is it like a free module on one so, generator for each? Well, again, we're, we're sort of moving back and forth between the field picture and the ring picture, but yeah, so I was starting out with the field picture because, because it's easier, course the picture yeah. is easier, right? So let's think about that. So yes. I mean, yes, I mean, there is this thing called the, the Hilbert class field, and it's like any of these abelian field extensions that, right? Any of these abelian field extensions, I hope I'm saying this right, uh, it, it has, you know, maybe there's some technical assumption that I'm relying on, but I don't, I don't think I'm relying on too many technic, important technical assumptions. Um, so it's, it's, Right, that Galois group acts on the that Galois group acts on the this this extension field. Yeah, and, and in fact, it acts on it in such a way that you know. So this so the, the, this this automorphism group is a is a is a finite abelian group, mm -hmm. and. You know, so you can decompose that 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 vector, the, the field as a vector space. Mm -hmm. You can decompose that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's see, let's see. I mean, let's pretend. Let's right, Let's pretend for a moment that this. Let, let's pretend for a moment that the 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 vector that the that the that the base field that we're dealing with here, let's pretend from a, the base field that we're dealing with here is, <laughs> let's see. I want to say that it is, let's see, let's see. Okay, I mean, it, right, you, you, you said, right, you said we should go to the field. And and one way you can think of that, go, if you've got, if you have the ring of integers, you can just tensor everything with the rationals and that will give you the field. Okay, yeah. But let's be a little bit more ridiculous. Let's tense it with the complex number. Okay. Because now when we tense it with the complex numbers, we have this, you know, finite dimensional representation of this abelian Galois group, finite abelian Galois group. And that representation decomposes. You yep. know, just like the into your reps. Yes, and and it's it it composes like the the regular representation. Oh, uh huh. That's cool. 
and, and right, and, and and probably all of the, a lot of the falsity of what I'm talking about is concentrating the idea of pretending that you know you could analyze the action of the Galois group uh -huh. on this underlying vector space of the field. In the general case, just as though you know you hadn't even bothered to tensor with the uh -huh. complex numbers first. Well, that's pretty interesting though because. You can tensor with the complex numbers, and then you get a simpler story that you could study. And then you can like, and then people do know, and I think it's not incredibly hard to figure out like how representations of finite abelian groups get more complicated over, well, at least over the rational numbers. And then <laughs> I guess you want to do it like over the, over the, but I guess you need to do it over these over this arbitrary field. Yeah, yeah could... s s something like that. But uh, but you're I think you're beginning to get a sense of what so we're like trying the, to do here. Yeah, go ahead. So like the uh, breaking things down into irreducibles, which work so draw one dimensional in the when you're working over the complexes. Some of those irreducibles will lump together to form larger irreducibles when you work over. A field that's smaller than the complexes and yes yes and things like uh things like if your group if your abelian group has some z mod p subgroup then uh some weird i don't know something weird happens when you look at representations that have a bunch of p-ishness sorry that got to be very vague at the end there but yes i've thought a little bit about yes this kind of thing so one of the things one of the simplifications we can try to take here is like we could just focus on quadratic extensions and these galois groups that where mm -hmm. everything is just a, a being galois groups where everything is just ordered to okay yeah that's a lot simpler and yeah, and in particular is, you know, that this, in, in that case, this action and this decomposition works perfectly, you know, already at Q. Right. Because the square roots of one are in there already. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, right. so, so that, you know, and, and, and these examples that we're playing around with here on the, on the screen are, are, are like that. That you know we're we're looking at we're, 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 we've got a lot of quadratic abelian extensions, so mm -hmm. we can try to get away with you know mm -hmm. not having to worry about some of these subtleties about uh -huh. analysis. Yeah, now it's slowly coming back to me. So part of what so one fun thing is like you can look at the irreps of Z mod P. Yes, and they. So like the, the irrep that you most want <laughs> is the one that where the generator of Z mod P acts, the, well, in the complex case, the, the sort of fun, fundamental irrep of Z mod P is the one where the generator of Z mod P acts by multiplication by a P root of unity. And, and so then, asking like oh can i do i have that irrep available to me if i'm working over some subfield of the complex numbers the answer is yes if the subfield has that p through if and only if that p root of unity is in your subfield right right so like with the one that we're looking at well like with the whole big story that we're looking at you'd be like especially worrying about like things like whether the whether the 20th root of unity or the fourth root of unity or the fifth root of unity are in the subfield that you're currently studying, meaning like you're climbing up this ladder. Again, well, we're just like looking at one rung of the ladder. And in that run, one rung of the ladder, your smaller field, it does not have a fifth root of unity in it 
And it does not have the square root of unity. Sorry, it does not have the fourth root of unity in it either. Right. So like you're likely to run into trouble trying to mimic what you did with the complex numbers starting from this smaller field. Yeah. I suspect. <laughs> But right. So extension. Just quadratic extensions. Oh, well, quadratic extensions should be okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're, do, you're dealing with a quadratic extension here, right? That is this particular yes. unwrapped wide extension. It's quadratic. So, okay. yes. Yes. So, yeah. So, oh, right. are you saying that like your false conjecture might be true in this case? Because nothing bad? Uh, <laughs> I thought it might be, but I that's not correct quite correct either so but i'm not sure about that um okay. so uh um so so what am i trying to say here so well, uh, well so so let me try to rephrase some of the conjectures here which are still supposed to be false but so what am i trying to say so there are There's an interesting contrast between two different algebraic groups, two different affine algebraic abelian groups here. And one of them is, I guess, maybe sometimes people call it C sub N. And it's the affine algebraic group of, uh, affine algebraic abelian group of, uh, nth roots of unity. So, you know, like it's, so, you, you know, you get an affine variety and there's a commutative ring and it's just, you know, it's just like, uh, I guess we're actually doing this over the integers, I guess. So we're taking, I mean, yeah, let, let me do an example here. Let me do n equals two <laughs> again. N equals two is a very safe example. So we have, am I saying this right? Z adjoin x and x squared equals two. Mm -hmm. And that's the, you know, that's the affine algebraic variety of square roots of unity. And you know that. Sorry, to be, I'm sorry to be sounding so uh, yeah pedant pedantic, but I guess if you're working over yeah. the integers, do they they don't call it a variety anymore? They call it a scheme or something. Uh maybe. Okay. I thought variety meant field, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. You, you, no, you, you you could use be be right. Okay. And um. And and it's not just an affine scheme. It's a, or I, perhaps I should say that this is not just a commutative ring. This is a commutative hop ring. And in fact, because the group of square roots of unity is an abelian group, um, it's actually a bicommutative hop ring. But mm -hmm. um, but okay, but so that, now there's another, th there's another, um, affine algebraic group, or maybe we should say affine algebraic group scheme here that we can deal with, which is a little bit different. Um, it's, uh, as a commutative ring, it is. Z squared. Now there's a subtle difference between these two affine algebraic abelian group schemes. Um, can you sort of see what the difference is? Yeah. 
how are you making what's your group structure for the group scheme structure for z mod for z squared is it sort of the same one <laughs> i mean it's just it's a, it's just the fact that it's it's like a it's like a discrete two point a being group so i mean it's like okay yeah yeah you, you, you know it, it's it's kind of the it's 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 really it's really living on this exponent too is really where the group structure is living but okay. it gets transported down okay no i don't see what the difference between these is then they're the well, same I, I, ring right and they're the same no they're not the same ring. oh what they're not the same ring. so this piece of graph paper here you know i've sort of oh wait, wait. around it a, a small part of it here but that is oh they're like oh, wait a minute so yeah so like in one of them if you uh, so is it like the difference between functions on a two-point space where you multiply the functions point-wise and functions on a two-point space where like one of those points is zero and one of them is one <laughs> and when you multiply the functions on it you got to you got to say that like the function over one times the function over one gives you a function over zero. So, sorry, the, the delta, the, the chronicler delta at one, one squared is the chronicler delta at zero. I'm not sure I follow this second description. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I see two different. Yeah, anyway, whatever. I think I see it. But go on. Well, so so let me try to let me let me let me try to. Um, I thought I just said it, but whatever. <laughs> well, okay, maybe you did. Okay, but let me ask you. So, I mean, I think there's a homo there's a homomorphism in at least one direction here, and maybe it's only going this way. Oh boy. Um, you know, because the generator here X could go to. One comma zero, but it could also go to zero comma one. No, is that am I saying that right? No, that's not correct. Right? Okay, I said that wrong. Um, so what what are the <laughs> when you said x, you wrote x squared equals two by the way, but you meant x squared equals one, right? I'm just hoping I haven't screwed up the tablet here. Um, right. Oh, x squared equals one. Yes. Okay. Thank you for fixing that. But let me show I can get this to work here. All right. Wait a minute. Let me try this again. Okay. I think. All right. Okay. Let's try to use the eraser a little bit. Okay. I'm going to try and use the. Okay. So you just corrected me to say that this should have been x squared equals one all along. Yeah, I just I read it as one because <laughs> I knew what you meant. What you said. Well, still, you should point these out. Yeah, yeah. No, I just I suddenly got scared. So okay. Um, so 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 yeah. So what are don't, don't don't tell me. Let me see if I can figure out if there really are just two things here. So what am I trying to say? Maybe there's more than two. Let's see. Uh, Can I say what some homomorphisms might do, or you don't? Now you're not going to let me. <laughs> and I actually uh, go start ahead, go ahead. things too well, then you like shut me up because <laughs> <So, laughs> you want to stay ahead. So anyway, so so X has got to get some set. To some pair of integers that squares to the to one comma one, right? Yeah, but you know what? M maybe what I should really say is maybe we should look at the homomorphisms from here to just to z, and then you know from as as soon as we know what the homomorphisms are from to z, then we can put those together. We can pair okay. those together to get homomorphisms to z squared. Okay, it sounds good. So okay. there should be two of them. Yes, and um, right. 
right now it seems pretty easy to see that there's x goes to one and this x goes to negative one uh -huh. and so what does that mean what does that mean they got um, four of them to work to the four of them, yeah are they are off oh but so okay right there are four of them but but, but maybe there are only two interesting ones two of two of them that are you know two of them that are on two yeah <laughs> i think that, that's part of the point is that they're not on two but they're into there are two of them that are into that are one to one is hard to yeah <laughs> yeah uh oh uh so you know we should take yeah well they gotta be yeah there's some let's take the first one be one and the second one be be negative one the first uh -huh. so 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 ah but i think right i think i think no matter which way we do it no, no matter which homomorphism we 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 um no matter which injective homomorphism we get we'll get the same image so yeah, we're saying that there's a subring of this thing over here. So um, right. So like, I mean, yeah. Some. So yeah, which ones are are in this, and which ones aren't in this? So you get the diagonal ones. Sorry, the anti-diagonal ones. It, well, the, we get a checkerboard inside the chessboard. Oh wow! Completely confused. Isn't that right? I hope I'm. I hope I'm not that badly confused. So. Yeah, you're right. I was completely confused. So X either gets sent to one negative one or negative one one. Yeah, so I guess I guess it's like uh wait, I, I, I can call this one X, I guess. And you know, this is like two X over here. Yeah. And where is X squared? <laughs> uh, are we gonna get the whole checkerboard? Yes. So I mean, yeah, when you work out what these rings are, you can see that this is a sub ring of this one. So it's it's geometrically, it's like right. Geometrically, the one it, the discrete one is mapping to this other, sort of slightly non-discrete one. And 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 right, that's because when you think of this in, in the sort of functorial picture of algebraic geometry, right, these correspond to different functors. Right? The discrete one just assigns to am I saying this right? Assigns to any field the same. Two element set. But this one that's the non discrete one, the one that's the roots of unity, for some fields, that doesn't give you a two element set. It just gives you a one element set because there are some fields where the. Oh. I guess it's the, the, I guess it's just the characteristic two ones, I guess. Then what? Some fields. Oh, that have one square root of one. Yeah, they just have one square root of one, single square root of one. So you see that right? This has something to do with ramification in some sense, geometrically. Um, right? Yes, yeah, so you, you, you think you have a double cover, but then there are certain special points this, where is this ramification? Special fibers, certain special fibers that are 
more collapsed than you were expecting. Those, mm -hmm. That's the ramified fiber or the, the fibers at which ramification is taking place. What were you saying? Is this ramification at two or is it ramification at negative one? <laughs> looks like it's uh, ramification at one or something like weird like that. But I have the feeling that it's a ramification at two in some sense, but I don't even want to think about that yet. Okay. Okay. Um, it probably yeah. is ramification at two. Because some weird is happening at the prime too, but yeah. 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 <laughs> so. Yeah. Wow, that's weird. I never thought about this. I mean, I never. I never expected that that these would be so similar yet different these things. Yeah, yeah. And 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 see this is see this is saying right, this is the reason for all those weird factors, weird factors of one half in like the Hadamard transform or something. What am I trying to say? It's like Right. This is this is like we're doing like Fourier analysis with respect to the finite of being group Z mod two. And what am I trying to say? That what am I trying to say? <laughs> See. See, we want to understand the difference between torsors of this one group and torsors of this other group. And, you know, we're, we're going to, when we eventually understand this or try to understand this, we're going to, you know, we're going to be thinking about these torsors in an algebraic geomet geometric way. These are, you know, al these are algebra geometric torsors that we're talking about here. So we have various ways that we can try to understand what this concept of an algebraic geomet algebra geometric torsor is. I mean, it, it, no, you can, you, can, you can think about it in the functorial way. You can also just think about it in a sort of See, at this point, we're only dealing with affine algebraic groups. So you can just think of it in terms of, you know, affine algebraic geometry, which is really just commutative algebra turned upside yep. down. So, um, you know, you can think of it in the functorial way, but that's a little bit overkill for these purposes. You can just think of it in terms of commutative algebra. But there's another way, which is also overkill, but it's a very interesting kind of overkill. And that's, you know, the... Um, the whole theory of algebra geometric theories, the sort of doctrine-based way of thinking, you know, thinking th th thinking that, you know, there are these two rigs instead of commutative rings. Um, and, and we're going to try to understand it in all of these ways. But so what am I trying to say? That, see, like a... Let me try to say in a very I've sort way. of lost the thread about how this stuff is connected to what you had been talking about. We had been right, but I might reconnect, but go ahead, yes. Yeah, okay. Right this well, second I might reconnect. Go ahead, yes. Okay. Well, anyways, just as long as you know that you sort of haven't too strongly yet. So you're sort of saying like, yes. oh, quadratic extensions, maybe my conjecture is more easy to understand. And so there's a lot of Z mod two stuff going on. And then you plunged into thinking about different ways to make the group Z mod two be sort of be turned into an affine algebraic group scheme. And so yes. I'm okay. Yes. So, okay, that's where I am. So I'm hoping that like one of those is gonna give one thing when you apply it to this other stuff. And, yeah. Something like that, something like that. So let's, let, let me try to say in a fairly concrete way what the difference is between the torsions of these two groups. 
So, uh -huh. and, and again, and, and, and perhaps we're thinking of this in a sort of, again, you should think of all these viewpoints at the same time, but maybe at the moment, I'm thinking in the functorial way, just for the moment. So in other words, you know, in the functorial picture, we specify a particular commutative ring, and then we say that what are the, you know, what is the functor evaluated at that particular commutative ring? Uh -huh. So um, uh, a what am I trying to say? Uh, Damn, I still don't understand how this thing works. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to say that uh, a C2 torsor is exactly the same thing. A C2 torsor over a commutative ring is exactly the same thing as an invertible module equipped with an isomorphism from its tensor square to the tensor unit. Say the first part of that again. A C2 torsor is a what kind of thing? C2 torsor over a commutative ring K. Over K. Uh -huh. is a an invertible module equipped with an isomorphism from its tensor square to the tensor unit. In fact, okay. or I guess you could say it another way. You could say that it's a Z. I, I hope what I just said is so you don't need to say invertible module, right? Because it's you, I guess that's true. I guess that's known inverse, yeah. Uh -huh. But another way you could say it is that I hope I, I, I'm not sure exactly how much fine print I'll need in this second one, but let me try to say it in another way. It's a commutative algebra, a Z, a Z mod two graded commutative algebra over your commutative ring with certain special properties. And I guess those special properties would be that each grade should be an invertible module. And maybe that's all you need. Huh. I think I sort of see. I think I sort of see that. Hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, the one grade, the non-trivial grade yeah. invertible module, that is the module that you were talking about before, right? The one whose square was the... Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's Don't right. you need the zero grade guy to be the trivial? Invertible module. Uh, I think that's automatic, actually. Um, a, a, you know, an invertible module. Oh, because it's Z mod two graded commutative algebra over K. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think the only invertible module with a ring structure is oh, maybe the unit itself, or something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I see. If, if I'm not screwing up. I think. Um, and I this stuff a lot because I think about two rigs a whole lot these days. And I think yeah. a whole lot, by the way, I mean, sometime I could tell you about this, but Todd and Joe and I are thinking a whole bunch about yeah. line bun, line objects, which are just yes. A, yes. invertible modules. And yeah, also I've done an enormous amount of thinking about that over the last decades, but go ahead. Yes. Go but, ahead. Yeah. And also stub line objects, which you've probably also thought about which well the sub subline yes yeah so like an even subline object is one whose exterior square is zero so it could be like for example the trivial yeah. zero the zero object is a subline object for example so yeah, anyway we're, we're, I did talk about this a lot yes uh -huh. go ahead. yeah go ahead. yeah well anyway we're working we're writing a paper about some aspects of this uh -huh. 
stuff. So anyway, I never really thought much about like focusing on line objects whose square is the identity or or some other finite order. But those, but that sounds like a lot of fun. It is. It is. Um, and um, so and and now you know so, so you know we're saying we're we're saying what a torsor a c a c mod two a c sub two torsor is over an arbitrary commutative rank k, but it's very interesting to think of the different flavor that you get depending on whether k is a field or perhaps the ring of algebraic integers in that field. So if you're working over the field, then you're not going to get any variety in the in what these invertible modules can be you know the field only has one invertible module over itself which is itself uh -huh. so there's gonna be some funny trade-off here right between the way it works over field and the way it works over the algebraic integers in the field the number field and the algebraic integers in the number field that Mm -hmm. So, whereas, right, by whereas, the way, yeah. by the way, time is almost yes up, but on yes. but um, oh, I yes. Would love, yes, I'd love to keep talking about this in the maybe in future days and yes. This kind of stuff that is really up my alley. Yes. So I wouldn't mind all sorts of wonderful digressions about these types of things. Sure. Well, at the moment, let's just try to figure out what our time thing is here. Um, it's already after 4 p.m. So we just kind of wrap it up and then try to continue. I mean, that's, we're kind of leaving it hanging in the middle, but uh, we could do that if you want. Uh, if you can somehow think of a punchline to tide us over until, uh, yeah, or, or like <laughs> wrap it up in 10 minutes or something like that, uh, in some tentative, just enough to, all right, I'll try, I'll try, continue later. Oh, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, we can't finish everything right now, but I can, oh, oh okay, so. Right, in, in, when, we're, when we're looking at the C2 torus over the field, we're not gonna get any variety in the invertible modules. They're all just the one, the one dimensional vector space, but we get sort of individual personality in the choice of uh, the isomorphism. In, in the choice of the isomorphism between the tensor square and the tensor unit. Because, oh, right, a, a, that field has a really big multiplicative group. So there's a lot of choice to, um, to pick there. And, and those are inequivalent choices as long as the... Am I saying this right? As long as the... As long as... There's not a square root of one. yes. As long as it's only one square root of one. <laughs> well, uh, well, no. What I was saying is is that it's it's kind of like the the choices that you're getting uh -huh. are kind of like the square free elements in the field. Um, you know, the square free the square free elements in the. I mean, it's really it's it's really it's really a quotient rather than a sub thing. It's really right. It's it's like we're taking the multiplicative group, but we're modding out by the squares. Okay, that's what I was. Yeah, that sounds better than what I was saying. That's what I should have been saying. So the, mm -hmm. that sounds right to me. And whereas over the ring of algebraic integers, it's it's a different flavor, right? I mean, you there you really do get choices about what the. Um, about what the invertible module could be because right the, every ideal class gives you an invert the that's what the uh, that's what the isomorphism classes of invertible modules are the the ideal classes here 
Yeah. And, and, and on the other hand, in this case, you have a very limited choice of what the isomorphism between the tensor square and the tensor unit could be. Because, right, the, the multiplicative, well, for some of these number fields, particularly the, you know, imaginary quadratic ones, for example, there's a very limited choice of what the, you know, the, the, the multiplicative group of the, uh, of the algebraic integers is very small. Um, so you don't, and, and plus you have to, you know, quotient out by the square ones. So you're you're ending up getting a very small choice. So you see what I'm saying? It's like uh -huh. when you're taking these C mod two torsors over the field, all the work is sort of in choosing this square free element uh, that gives you the isomorphism. Whereas when you're working over the ring of algebraic integers, most of the work is in choosing this ideal class, this ideal class of order two. Mm -hmm. So and then the map from the number ring into the field, does that let you play, does that let me pull back a torsor from the field to one of the number ring? Or is it is it contravariant that way or does it go the other way? There should be uh, some way that you can turn a torsor from one of those guys into a torsor in the other guy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so which way does it go? Yeah. Uh, um, this is important to get straight, but uh, I... I <laughs> okay. I, I mean, anyway. I'm not sure I can do it under pressure, but um, it, okay, it's never important, mind. important but, to think about that. Yeah, because then that would let you compare these two different stories you're just told. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. And, and so now one of the things that's going on here is that also when you're working over a field, then you can't see the difference between the C2 torsors and the Z mod 2 torsors. Right? Because, right, if you tensor this subring that we were talking about, if you, right, we have, the, we have this, we have this funny inclusion of a subring of an index two subring you know from the walking square root of unity to z squared but 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 that but but that non-isomorphism becomes invertible when you tensor it with the rationals you said field but i guess you meant like a Field, it's an extension of the rationals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. You need to right. divide by two. a number field. Yeah. yeah. A number field. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, right. I mean, these, these field spectrums, I sometimes call them like uh, voodoo spectrums or something like that because they have all these voodoo needles stuck in them. They're, they're, every point has been removed from the spectrum. Oh. With only the generic point, only the global generic point is left in the, uh -huh. of the field. And so in other words, you know, there is no ramification when you're dealing, no ramification in an obvious sense when you're dealing, when you're working over a field. I mean, Right. I mean, the holes have been already been moved, so you can't <laughs> ask whether. <laughs> it's pointless to ask. Yeah, something like that. Something <laughs> like that. Yeah, I'm not saying this very well, but yeah. um. Okay, but now let's think about let's let's think about what the Z mod two torsors tor tor are like in general. I mean, like I say, you can't see the difference over a field very well. But think about what the Z mod two torsors are like over a ring. You mean number field? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. See them over F two really well. Yes, you're right. I guess that's really important. But um, uh, right. That's that's really <laughs> crucially important. But somehow I'm focusing on something else. Um, so uh, 
the well, let's try to say concretely what a Zen mod two torsor is. Okay, so it is a two dimensional module. equipped with a sort of, I'm not sure how to say it exactly, a sort of non-degenerate involution. Yeah, I got to figure out better ways to say this, but um, with an action of, uh, yeah, <laughs> never mind. Yeah, right. I see Right. Uh, in, in fact, right. Okay. So, so you know, we're 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 sort of hopelessly behind on getting to a punchline. But let's just. I, I'm, I've got one punchline here, and then we'll quit. Okay. Uh -huh. So the punchline is this. You, you know, we raised the question of which one of these can you get the other one from, and and my claim now is that from a D mod two torsor, I think you can always get a Z mod two torsor, but not vice versa. Because given a C mod two torsor, you can just add the two grades together, take the direct sum of the two grades, and you know put this eigenvalue, put the eigenvalue negative one on one grade and the eigenvalue one on the other grade, uh -huh. and that will be a diagonalizable Z mod two torsor. But there are these non-diagonalizable C2 torsors. Sorry, <laughs> what I'm saying. There are these, no, right. No, there are none of those, but there are non-diagonalizable Z mod two torsors. And those are the ones that are not C sub two torsors. Right, so. Right, like look, look, look at the picture I've got here. Right, this sub ring here. Right, yeah. Am I saying this right? On on the right on the sub ring, there's a one eigen space and a negative one eigen space, and that's all there is. But on the whole Cartesian product thing, there is, you know, these this the opposite color of bishop thing. And those are not clearly in one eigenspace or the other. They're sort of in a twilight zone between the two eigenspaces. Uh, I'm confused. Sorry, I don't get it. I mean, isn't there like an eigenspace here and an eigenspace there? Those are eigenspaces of what? Of this Galois action, this Z mod two Galois action. I mean, this is the one eigenspace, the main. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. I used the wrong convention. I guess I guess X is supposed to be up here in the usual convention. So this should be the negative one eigenspace. The main diagonal should be here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So am I saying that right? No, I, I guess, I, I, yeah, okay. So, right, uh, one is up there and X, right, X is on the, right, X is on the off diagonal, right. One is on the main diagonal. So, right. You're talking about right. eigenspaces for multiplication by X. Is that what you're talking about? Eigenspaces for multiplication by X, yes. Okay, and X. Is, is that right? Uh, no, I don't think it's multiplication by X. I think it's, Switching x with negative x. Oh. I'm confused. Eigenspaces for the. Uh, for the z so there's a z mod to action on this. Oh boy, there's a Z mod two action on that ring that you wrote down. If you wrote the, which sends X to negative X, 
That's right. That's right. That's right. I should sort of think of it as somehow turning around the two points in this two point. Right. Like I say, it's it's um, this this is the negative one eigenspace. This off diagonal is the negative one eigenspace. Yeah. Here's x and here's negative x over here. So it's going. Yeah. Okay. And that's all there is in this subring. This whole subring is just made up of the 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 one eigenspace and the negative one eigenspace. Okay. But in z squared, you've also got you know things like that, and those aren't expressible in terms of eigen. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. Uh, those don't decompose into right something just from right. Yeah, it's not a clean decomposition. So, right. That's so. That's 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 answer. Oh, that's supposedly answering that question about which way does the inclusion go that you know the the c2 torsors are included into the z mod 2 torsors but not the other way around and this is i mean i'm just trying to quit right now but i'm just trying to say this is what we're going to be looking at we're going to be looking at these ideals we're going to be looking at these uh-huh the, these these like things like the Hilbert class extension, the Hilbert class field, that's supposed to be like a torsor of, I guess it's a torsor of probably the dual of the ideal class. Can I say that right? <laughs> Again, I get the, the duality. Right. Now you're really, yeah. <laughs> and I'm hitting that homology, yes. homology yeah. cohomology problem. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. well, I hope you're getting some idea of where I'm going here. I mean, we're running out of time, so we just kind of have to quit here, but I, I hope you get some vague idea of where I'm going here. Yeah, I do, definitely. And I love this type of stuff. Uh, okay, so. okay. Okay, so yeah, I did a bad job today. I, again, I'm blaming technical reasons for some of the problems here. I was, you know, didn't get any chance to prepare because I've had so much trouble with these computers growing up on me. But uh, I'll, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have less good excuses for that next time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, so thanks a lot. And I'll see you hopefully next week. Okay, okay. See you. Okay. Yeah. Bye.